Welcome to chapter 3 of the Gospel of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. What is the matter with evolution? Highlighting the problem. We hear a lot about evolution these days. Scientists seem to have embraced the subject as though it were the second coming of, well, science. But where has it got us? Are we to believe that just because we are descended from a common ancestor shared with monkeys, dogs or whatever, that we understand our situation on this earth any better than we would, evolu than we would without evolution to guide us? Is evolution going to somehow make my life more satisfying? Can evolution put food on my table? Will it save the earth from global warming? The answer to all of the above is a big no. And why is that? Because evolution is about as useful as a screen door on a submarine. Sure, scientists while away their days trying to devise this or that proof to show that evolution is a credible idea. But as long as it's just a theory, no one in the real world is going to take it seriously. So I have decided to do some debunking of my own. To show the world that the big bad scientists aren't all that, as the kids like to say. What is evolution but the gradual change of species over a lengthy period of time as a result of various internal and external selective pressures? My grandfather, who is as old as dirt, has been through that. According to early lithographs, he, has, he was quite a looker in his days. Uh, but now, a century later, after years of hard drinking and working in the mines, he has no hair and looks like shit. Could evolution just mean growing old? I posed this question to a scientist friend who explained that the change has to take place over many generations. you think the evolutionists would have stated that right out front. And I admit that I stand corrected. <coughs> But evolution still sounds a lot like growing old to me. And I can't help thinking that this is where the evolutionary scientists first got their wacky ideas. Having cleared up this common confusion, let us move on to the proposed selective force of evolution, namely natural selection. What on earth is this supposed to mean? Is there unnatural selection? And, why, and who is doing the selecting? Neither of these questions could be answered by my scientist friend, and so I have been forced to ditch my now former friend and perform my own research. What follows is, to the best of my ability, what I've been able to uncover regarding evolution and natural selection. A closer examination of natural selection. Apparently, there are not one but two forms of selection. They are natural selection and sexual selection. I let you over over the second sexy form of selection for a minute, at least until I have torn the first one to shreds. According to the neo-Darwinists, most evolutionary change is attributable to natural selection, meaning that individuals carrying genes that are better suited to their environment will leave more offspring than individuals carrying genes that make them less adaptive. Over time, these more adaptive traits will pro proliferate, altering the genetic uh, composition of the overall population, since individuals with better fitness pass more of their genes into the next generation. It is this process, scientists will tell you, that produced the platypus, the penguin and the poodle, leading us to conclude that scientists are definitely full of shit. If someone can explain to me the adaptive trait of the duckbill, then they can certainly tell me why the platypus is the only mammal on the planet that has one. Are platypi, pusses, who knows, concerned with ingratiating themselves into local duck populations? Do they think they are funny? Who, why do they have a bill? I'll take it easy on the scientists regarding the platypus, because obviously it is a tough one. But I'm sure there are several hundred scientists right now earning their tenure in a pointless search for the evolutionary significance of this ridiculous creature. I close on the platypus by stating an alternative theory that I've come up with. The flying spaghetti monster made the platypus because, unlike scientists, he has a sense of humor.
It is an unlikely sign from God, and until someone can prove me wrong, and that is my theory. I will next turn to more ordinary and boring examples of natural selection, which I will tend to proceed to slice to ribbons. Let us look at the fascinating case of bacteria. It is well known that antibiotics are used to cure various illnesses caused by bacteria, and it is equally well known that most bacteria eventually develop immunity to these antibiotics. Looking a little closer at the case of um, Staphylococci, we find that in 1929 Sir Alexander Fleming first observed the bacterium Staphylococci the to experience inhibition and on an agar plate contaminated contaminated by a penicillin mold. Sir Alexander Fleming, or F-Man, as the Queen liked to call him, isolated the penicillin to make penicillin, which then went to on to be known as a wonder drug for many diseases, mainly VD. But gradually penicillin in its natural form became useless. Scientists will tell you that the bacterium which replicates faster than a chinchilla in a Cialis factory, eventually developed a strain of itself that was resistant to naturally formed penicillin. And that the process of natural selection caused this res resistant strain to propagate in nature. This is an outright lie, which I will decimate, decimate momentarily. If we look at bacteria that grow resistant to antibiotics, insects that grow resistant to DDT, or each an HIV that grows resistant to antiviral drugs, we see a fascinating correlation between natural selection and resistance. But what are we really seeing here? I submit that they are not changing their genetic makeup, they are changing their minds. In short, they are getting smarter. If I go to your house and you feed me a shit sandwich two days in a row, I'm having lunch at the McDonald's on the third day. It is that simple. Don't let the scientists which, uh, with their big phallic bact bacterial names tell you anything different. They're not as smart as they pretend to be, no matter how much they try to demean so-called lower life forms. One other example of natural selection should just about put this puppy to bed. Scientists have pointed to artificial selection to show that humans, by providing their own specific set of selective forces, can mimic the forces of nature. We see this over and over again in the actions of breeders, who, purpor who purport pur purportedly have wrought immense changes in plants and animals. We can look to the various breeds of dogs as an example, where claims were made that all dog species originate from one common source, the ancestral wolf. From this ferocious beast we are expected to believe that a diverse assortment of species was created by man himself. Such four, -legs, such four legged brutes as the chihuahua, the dachshund and the poodle, and the bulldog, all of which have been with us since time immemorial. This breeding myth appears to be a form of propaganda, possibly put forth by anti-intelligent design campaigners. Although I'll save my conversation about intelligent design for a later chapter. How can we believe such claims man's best friend when it is obvious that the common observer uh, to the common observer that every breed has been put on this planet to serve a purpose? I, for one, would point to the FSM as the creator of dogs. Although there is valid evidence that God, if he is ever proven to exist, might have had a hand in their creation. After all, aren't all aren't Alsatians meant to provide us with protection, maybe even from their own forefathers the wolf? Weren't poodles and chihuahuas put on this earth to make us feel better about ourselves? There can be little doubt that an intelligent creator put all the species on earth to serve man, and evolution wasn't even properly invented until the late 1800s. Is that, time, uh, is that enough time to get a Labrador Retriever from a dire wolf? I think not. If you don't buy this argument, consider this one last example, which in this case regards plant species. If you look at domestic cabbage, broccoli, kale, cauliflower and Brussels sprouts, are we to, cl to claim even if they did originate from a common ancient, ancient wild cabbage, that selection, be it natural, artificial, whatever, could not have done better over the last few thousand years? 
The answer is written in the squinched up face of every child with a Brussels sprout in his or her mouth. Yet another strike against evolution. From pirates to people. Any discussion of evolution will eventually lead us to ourselves. Humans have been around for as long as we can remember. And yet evolutionists will tell you that we weren't. They will tell you that humans and chimpanzees are share a common ancestor some 5 million years ago. And that we diverged from that common ancestor and eventually invented the space shuttle while chimpanzees were only able to invent the stick. To support this thesis, scientists tell us that we share 95% of our DNA with chimpanzees. And yet, we share 99.9% .9 of our DNA with pirates. I ask you, who is, the most more li who is the more likely common ancestor? And are the pirates not the chosen people of the FSM? Why do we spend so much time talking about something that didn't happen, while the FSM is dangling his noodly appendages right in front of our face? But I shall persevere just a little further, and I shall examine the human body, specifically I will examine organs that have been deemed vesticle, vesticle, sorry, or useless as a result of losing their function over millennia of evolution. Wisdom teeth. Fallacy. Emerging in adulthood, these teeth are thought to have served as extra grinding surfaces for early man who, before the advent of proper dental care, would most likely have lost many of his teeth by his mid-twenties. Fact: It is common knowledge that our pirate ancestors ate a diet much rougher and more manly than our diets today. Also, they tended to carry their knives set deep in the back of their mouth. It is logical, then, that they need extra teeth. Male nipples. Scientists uh, fallacy. F scientists believe that all humans had breasts or ducks back in the Stone Age. Fact: Male nipples were used by pirates as portable weather stations. With their nipples, they were able to determine the direction of the trade winds and, depending on stiffness, how cold it was outside. <coughs> goosebumps. Fallacy. Evolutionary propaganda would have you believe that goosebumps are an atavistic now useless response to distress, be it emotional or weather related, that was once meant to raise the hair on our early forefathers, causing them to appear larger and scarier. Fact: Goosebumps are a clearly are a cleverly disguised feature and that allowed for increased buoyancy once a pirate hit cold water. By simply appearing they raised the surface area, thus increasing buoyancy. This made pirates float better something that was very useful to our ancestors, as they were sometimes without boats. Naturally, goosebumps seem to be vestigial reflex, but it's really society that has changed. Appendix. F fallacy. This is a remnant of an internal pouch used to ferment the hard-to-digest plant diets of our ancestors. Fact. The appendix was a clever internal pouch utilized for hiding a pirate's gold. It is also the inspiration for the saying, cough it up, which pirates would demand of defeated pirates once they've boarded their ships. The tailbone. Fallacy. Uh, evolutionists claim that the tailbone, or coccyx, uh, which has no documented use, is an unusual remnant of a larger bone growth that might once have formed an ancestral tail homologous to the functional tail of other pirates. Oh, sorry, of other primates. Fact. Humans with tails. Are scientists high? Couldn't the coccyx have served other purposes? I have carefully researched this issue and have compared the uh, coccyx to other unusual bone growth in animals. And the literal has led me to a single overriding conclusion. Lots of animals have horns on their head. And these aren't thought to be the remnants of a of larger bone growth, probably because unlike the coccyx, uh, horns serve a purpose today. But what if the original purpose of the coccyx has simply been rendered useless by today's culture? If you examine the coccyx closely, you will see that this bony growth is very similar when you think about it. To a horn, which is the structure used by many animals for fighting, I 
I submit then that the coccyx is not a vestige of an ancestral tail, but rather an effective, albeit strangely placed, defensive and fighting mechanism. I imagine that two opponents fighting over a woman or choice cave real estate would have run backward at each other, their asses outstretched, much to by elk fight with their horns. I have termed this ass fighting. This makes sense if you think about it, as it would leave their hands free to carry whatever they needed, most likely food or rocks. As further evidence to, uh, to that the coccyx is a fighting feature, and that some knowledge of its use has survived uh, culturally through the, day, to the, through the years, consider how quickly someone will run away from you if you run at them backwards. Ask first. I suggest that those who doubt this hypothesis put it to the test and attempt to, run, uh, to ram their ass into everyone they see for the next few days. I feel confident that most of, if not all, of these targets will at the very least be afraid. I see no other explanation for why this would occur, other than that we know, subconsciously, that the coccyx is a weapon, not a vestigial tail. One other vestigial feature. Fallacy. The human genome provides evidence that we humans were not created ex nihilo, but instead had to evolve systematically. Just like all the other animals, as evidence, scientists point to lots of non-functional DNA including many inactive pseudogenes that were functional in some of our ancestors but aren't today. One example is often cited is the case of vitamin C synthesis. While all primates include humans, including humans, carry the gene responsible for synthesizing vitamin C, that gene is inactive in all members of the primate family but one, man. Scientists point uh, to this as evidence of our shared lineage, although I can't figure out why. Fact. Pirates, our ancestors, lived in the tropics and ate a lot of fruit. Evolution gets sexy. Finally, I will address sexual selection, which I promised some time earlier. The basic concept behind sexual selection is that one gender of the species, um, usually the female, actively chooses members of the opposite sex to copulate with. Based on certain criteria, thus placing a selective pressure on the species as a whole. Sexual selection explains the bright foliage of male birds, the impressive re, uh, ritualistic duels among male rams, deer, elk and other ungulates, and the high percentage of human hummers being driven by short, ugly men. In short, sexual selection depends on the success of certain individuals over others of the same sex while natural selection is a non-gender specific. In the interest of modernity, I move that Congress pass a bill outlawing this backward and sexist practice. practice. The spaghetti, de sp spaghetti deity. Sorry. While I have essentially decimated the theory of evolution throughout these pages, it is important to state that a great deal of credible evolutionary evidence does exist. No one can dispute a fossil record which shows a clear and gradual transformation of species over time, albeit with frustrating gasp, gaps. And I ask you, who could have put them there? And there do indeed appear to be selective forces at work in the world, for instance, when drunks walk out onto the, uh, onto the road and are hit by cars. We are not saying that evolution can't exist, only that it is guided by his noodly appendage. And our specularity is extremely modest. For some reason, he went through a great deal of trouble to make us believe that evolution is true, masking the prominent role of pirates in our origins, making monkeys seem more important than they really are, generally keeping behind the scenes and out of the spotlight. In spite of his low profile, Though let no one doubt that the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is not only a groundbreaking religion, but is also supported by the hard science, making it probably the most unquestionably true theory ever put forth in the history of mankind. To make my point, I will turn to the modern day problem of global warming. Pirates, as you know, are his chosen people. Yet their numbers have been shrinking ever since the 1800s. Consequently, we find the global warming, earthquakes, hurricanes and other natural disasters are a direct result of the shrinking number of pirates. To illustrate the fact, 
I have included the well-known graph from a recent study. As you can see, there is a statistically significant inverse relationship between pirates and global temperature. But of course, not all correlations are casual. For example, take a look at this seeming uh, correlation regarding ID, proponent, ID proponents. It would appear that the people behind ID have a lower intelligence quotient than the general population. And a significantly lower IQ than scientists, who overwhelmingly reject the idea of intelligent design. I, for one, tend to believe this to be merely a strange coincidence, and that the ID believers are not necessarily as retarded as the data would suggest. It is entirely likely that the flying spaghetti monster put this coincidence in place in order to confuse us further as to our true origins. We may never know. FSM versus other religions. A conversation about intelligent design proponents, uh, no matter how brief and suspicious, inevitably leads us to a discussion about God and religion. <clears throat> It is important to state up front that the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is a peaceful religion, probably the most peaceful of them all. But can we prove that? In order to explore our proposition, let us look at religion and violence throughout history, particularly with regard to war and death. Christianity appears to be the Rambo of religions, with the Crusaders, the Inquisition, various bloody rebellions, the conquistadors, the list seems nearly endless. Suffice it to say that when Jesus Christ started, stated, in his bewitching and Yoda-like manner, but those enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me, people took them pretty literally. The Jews and the Muslims haven't done so well for themselves either, and are still duking it out. We even find Buddhists fighting in China. So, glossing over the evidence, we find that religion can be quite scary and violent. On the other hand, there is absolutely no evidence of any death from FSMism, which seems to imply that it has the lowest death rate. And if that is true, then this is strong evidence that FSMism is the most peaceful religion. Now take a look at how much uh, criticism of Christianity, Islam, Judaism and the other religions there is. People can't seem to decide on the simple things, like which holy book to follow, let alone whether any of it is true. There are arguments between friends and countries, tens of thousands of books on the various religions, all poking holes, gibbering about which gods to worship, uh, jabbering about which ancient prophets cousin to support, and it's a mess. And yet we found that exactly, uh, exactly count them zero books have been written to poke holes in the theory of the flying spaghetti monster. There isn't even any academic criticism, only academic support. Academics love to argue about everything. All this we take as evidence that FSMism is probably true. Finally, we find that the religions tend to put a lot of stock in dogma, which is a way of saying they are, are correct beyond all doubt. Even the most devout of the Pastavarians will scratch their heads and nervously readjust their eye patches at this idea. Dogma implies an absolute belief in something and in order for people to have an absolute belief in anything, they basically have to be omniscient. We have a different approach. FSM believers reject dogma. Which is not to say that we don't believe we are right. Obviously we do. We simply reserve the right to change our beliefs based on new evidence or greater understanding of old evidence. Our rejection of dogma is so strong that we leave open the possibility there is no flying spaghetti monster at all. So in a sense we could say that we are extremely open minded, we could change our minds someday and all we ask is proof of his non-existence. An alternate vision. A note from Peter J. Snodgrass, PhD, and the Imam Peres Javari. Uh, read Udi in a not so intelligent world. When confronted with the grim realities of war, famine, pestilence, diarrhea, and Celine Dion, it is not entirely surprising that one might be led to consider that our Creator, while all powerful, might not have proven himself to be completely infallible. 
Well, there can be no doubt that the source of creation was indeed the flying spaghetti monster, and that he did leave mysterious and ambiguous clues to throw us off rack, off track. We submit that the FSM was careless, cruel, drunk, or even high when he first laid down the template for life as we know it. How else to explain the extinction of 99.9% .9 of all plant and animal species ever to exist on Earth? How else to explain the release of not one, but two Juice Bigelow films? Without question, we are members of a small and limited minority of scientists and religious leaders who, decide, who deign to question the Creator's wisdom in allowing for life-threatening volcanoes, tsunamis, hurricanes, twisters and plastic surgery gone bad. But as the evidence accumulates, we can only posit one undeniable theory. The FSM, our Creator, isn't very bright. Undoubtedly, this statement represents a subtle paradigm in shift. Sorry, this undoubtedly this statement represents a subtle paradigm shift, especially when juxtaposed against the common perception of a benevolent, all-knowing creator. But innumerable examples of questionable judgment do exist. Something is certainly rotten in Denmark when Ben Affleck is allowed to bet both J Lo and the hottie from Alias while Matt Damon is forced to date his own assistant. We cry foul. So we hereby state our belief that the universe is a result of unintelligent design, UD. Casting social science aside, we can turn to the physical science to support our claims. Why doesn't the benevolent and noodly master go to work and start eradicating mass poverty, cancer, global warming and nuclear uh, proliferation? proliferation sorry. Is he too busy trying to rekindle the low-carb diet craze? While this treatise might not appear to meet the normal requirements of an academic paper, let it be said that such was not even our intention, this is a work composed um, by a scientist and a religious leader. If science and religion are to live side by side in mutual non-judgment, there needs to be a new model for dialogue one that takes into account the interests of both uh, sides. Religious people don't really do numbers. Scientists can't get dates and don't have a clue what real people think. By collecting and presenting a different kind of data, we aim to appeal the Bible thumpers and brainiacs alike, just getting those epithets out and out on the table and make a difference. In fact, we feel better already. Too many resources are being wasted in trying to prove intelligence in all we see around us. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be better just to throw in the towel, call a spade a spade and admit that our creator is a dumbass? Examples of unintelligent design The dodo Portuguese sailors who marveled at this bird, uh, trusting uh, and docile nature, gave it the name dodo, meaning simpleton. Unfortunately, the dodo was unable to compete in a rapidly changing environment and the burnt bird soon went the way of the Portuguese sailor. The passenger pigeon Once the most popular bird in North America, the passenger pigeon's demise can be traced back to the early 1900s and McDonald's highly popular but short-lived McPigeon sandwich. The Irish elk Neither exclusive Irish nor an elk. It was really a large deer. The male of the species attracted mates based on the size of its antlers. The larger the antlers, the more attractive the male. As the selective pressures for a nice rack increased, the head of the male grew so overburdened that the males began to fall easy prey to large predators that were moving into northern Europe at the time. All the less impressive males just drank themselves to death. The llama. The typical llama is unable to produce milk or eggs, and many people can't even spell its name. The appendix might once have had a value, but is now completely useless. No one really knows why it remains, although some have been found to hold coins. Religious warfare. Someone has described religious warfare as killing people over who has the best invisible friends. We tend to agree. Disco. Scientists are still split on this dance craze, but the FSM doesn't like it, so it goes on the list. The Macarena, true fact, invented by a gay named Ritardo. Jar Jar Binks, he's just stupid. The duck built platypus. Question, 
What creator combines a duck with a muskrat? A. Answer. Not an intelligent one. And with that, uh, we conclude chapter 3 of the Gospel of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. If you liked what you heard, please consider subscribing and sharing this video, as well as hitting that like button. I hope to see you next time when I go into the fourth chapter.